Hello, and welcome to our show. We are so glad you joined us today. Yes. We have something so unique and special to Kentucky. I'm Darlene Pickford. And I'm Greg Bauer. And of course, we have our two little friends with us, with Wicket with me, and a little Angie little over Angie here. Little Angie over here. And you'll hear more about her a little bit later. But you said something very interesting, uh, Darlene. Uh -huh. uh, before I do that, I do want to tell our viewers about a couple of yes. upcoming shows. Uh, one on uh, allergies that cats and dogs can have and uh -huh. what we can we do about them. Yes. And also then a little variation on the quilt theme. Uh, we're going to be looking at some quilt blocks for animal lovers, and you'll you'll enjoy seeing that uh, some things done by some youngsters that are really nice. Yes. But anyway, so what's on tap for today? Well, we have something very unique. We're going to be talking about moths and butterflies, okay. particularly to Kentucky. Okay. And hey, listen, I Greg. Uh, I'm ignorant, so this is going to be a show to educate me. Why don't you introduce our guest? I'll, I'll be happy to. Uh, our guest today is Bill Black, who is from Paducah, and he's an expert on butterflies and moths. And Bill, thank you so much for taking time to share your thoughts with us today. And we're so glad you're here. Well, I'm, I'm going to start here. off. Tell me the difference between <laughs> a moth and a butterfly. <laughs> uh, the difference traditionally has been described in the antennae. Uh, butterflies have club-like antennae. Uh -huh. uh, they smell through their antennae, okay. butterflies and moths. And moths have all other type of antennae, and they may be comb-like, okay. feathery, uh, or they may be straight and hair-like. Uh, but they tend not to look like a club the way the butterfly antennae did. And they have a um, scientific name uh, that goes with that and says that concept in Latin. And Rapelocera oh, wow. are butterflies, and Heterocera, all other type of antennae, okay. are moths. Um, what's interesting is that uh, there are about ten times as many uh, species of moths in the world as butterflies, and that's so for Kentucky. Oh, really? Uh, okay. In Kentucky, we have about 230, 250 species of butterflies, and we have about 2,500 species of moths. Oh, wow. Why are they these two these moths and butterflies important to our ecology? Uh, th they feature in the ecology especially because they're like, they're a bellwether uh, measurement of how healthy uh, the environment is. Okay. They, the, the best analogy is that butterflies um, to the uh, health of the uh, climate are analogous to the canary in a coal mine. Oh. They're, much more sensitive to the uh, variations in the climate, and uh, they will uh, fare well if there are not changes in it, and if there are changes either getting colder or hotter, you'll notice it, um, that they begin to not fare as well in some places as others. Okay, hmm. how about with our crops? With crops, traditionally, they're considered uh, pollinators along with uh, honeybees. Uh -huh. um, they uh, they, in fact, are often particular to certain kinds of plants. Uh -huh. the, we, the food plant that we talk about is usually the plant that the caterpillar of a particular species of butterfly or moth uh, eats. Um, the nectar flowers are what the adults go to to get a drink. Mm -hmm. And okay. not, not all uh, butterflies and uh, moths uh, drink um, in their adult stage, but those who do uh, generally go to, okay. uh, and they have a wide variety of flowers they go to. Some don't go to flowers. Some uh, butterflies uh, and moths that would go naturally to tree sap um, or fermented fruit that is um, uh, available naturally to them, um, uh, they don't go to flowers generally. There are some that go to both, but uh, mm -hmm. we set traps to catch uh, butterflies and moths based on uh, the tendency of certain species to um, to go to rotting fruit. Okay. Right. What do we have up front right, here? Right here, uh, this uh, box is of butterflies, as is uh, this Cornell drawer. Uh -huh. um, uh, these are moths over here. Okay. Um, as are the other three Cornell drawers. Uh -huh. So you see that um, there's a greater diversity in the size of moths and um, in the 
the moths' colors generally are muted. Um, I especially enjoy moths because that muted beauty is largely unseen. Um, it's yes. at night. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, that's why we're not as aware of moths as butterflies. And their, their colors are beautiful, but their earth tones, they tend not to be quite as spectacular and um, uh, shocking uh, <laughs> beauty as the butterflies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, this is all interesting, Bill, because I think the average person, uh, myself included, we've always seen butterflies, how beautiful they are, and when the wor word moth, moth comes up, wh where are the mothballs? Well, That's and, right. <laughs> and you're usually thinking of uh, some critters in this range. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Not, not so interesting. Actually, there are some micros there. This one over here is a micro, uh, and his wingspan, when it, when it spread, is a little bit more than an eighth of an inch. Okay. Um, and uh, they're really the rain. There are only two or three species that eat uh, wool clothes, um, and we have thousands <laughs> of species of moths. Um, in fact, these uh, uh, giant silk moths, uh -huh. the wild silk moths, uh, don't eat. Uh, they don't. They don't bother any. They eat the caterpillars. Eat tree leaves, but that's not even a devastating. Uh, uh -huh. uh, effect on the tree. Yeah. Oh. So that moths really are very, very essential to our environment. Yes. And that uh, uh -huh. we need to preserve them in as fact, best we can, just like the, the moths very often have evolved with the flowers that they pollinate. In fact, there's a very famous one in Madagascar that uh, Charles Darwin hypothesized must exist when he discovered a flower in uh, Madagascar that had an especially <coughs> deep uh, throat in its structure, uh -huh. and uh, they, the moth was not yet described or known, and he hypothesized that there must be, uh, as he said, a, a, a yet undiscovered moth with a wonderfully long proboscis that could reach down into that um, bugle-shaped flower and uh -huh. pollinate it inadvertently oh, I gotcha. in right. drinking the nectar. Okay. Of it. I understand. And about over 100 years after Darwin, um, uh, or over a hundred years after that prediction and after his death, um, such a moth was discovered. And it was a f in the sphinx moth family. This uh -huh. uh, uh, drawer right there are sphinx moths. And they hover before flowers, and they very often are mistaken at dusk for a hummingbird. Oh. Because oh. their behavior is similar to a hummingbird's. Okay. A very, very interesting. Oh, wow. And, and there's a, there is one with a yucca plant, uh, a micro moth. Um, and if a yucca plant blooms, you know, they have white blossoms, the ones around here, yucca filamentosa, uh -huh. I think is the species that we have around here. They, um, yucca is not natural to our area, right. but they thrive here if they're planted here. And they don't bloom unless they're infested with that micro moth. I didn't know that. Because uh, it, uh, it's eating the, uh, some of the pollen and it's burrowing around in the flower. and uh, inadvertently pollinates the flower that way. Well, we need to take a short, short break, break at this point and as we're growing in our education Cation. about Absolutely. butterflies and moths and take a look at a happy tale. This is about a sweet little cat named Angie. Um, in fact, mm -hmm. she's sitting on Darlene's she, lap. She's sitting right here. She has a wonderful story, so give a listen. Hi, my name is Angie and I am a beautiful female cat that is about one and a half years old. I don't remember much about my early life. One day, a lady found me, and I guess that I had been hurt pretty badly, but can't remember what happened. The lady worked in a nursing home, and the residents took up a collection to pay the vet bills to fix my injuries. The vet had to amputate one of my back legs, and I lost part of my eyesight. The lady took me to an empty apartment in the nursing home, and I stayed there for several months by myself. She fed me and did what she could to help me. Finally, she took me to a shelter in Mayfield and asked them not to put me down. Darlene and Greg found out about me through an article in the paper and came to the shelter to see about me. When they came, I had just been spayed and wasn't feeling very good. They took me home to Paducah and a vet found that I had a very bad upper respiratory infection. With loving care and antibiotics, I bounced back and became a member of Darlene and Greg's home. I found that I had nine other sister and brother cats and a brother dog. It has taken some time for them to get used to me and for me to get used to them, but all is now going fine. I love my new home and family. 
I can jump almost as well as the rest of the other cats. And Greg can always tell when I'm running because of the thump, thump on the floor. Thank you, Darlene and Greg, for saving my life and giving me a wonderful and loving home. Well, that's a true story, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> There's always room for one more. We didn't ask. Yeah. Uh, Angie lost an eye and a leg and has a little broken nose. And a wonderful lady named Lee took her in and they uh, paid for a vet bill and really took good care of her, but were unable to find a permanent home. So she's with us. <laughs> and uh, she, she loves to watch TV with me. She's a good lap kitty. So, mm. And Angie, all these butterflies and moths are not to be chased today, okay? <laughs> so, uh, Well, Bill, let's go back to uh, our discussion. Uh, why don't you tell us something about... Uh, the, uh, the Society of Lepidopterists here in Kentucky, yeah. and also how our viewers might be able to find uh, a website for that. Yeah. Um, the website is, uh, you would uh, Google um, and search for um, Society of Kentucky Lepidopterists. Right. Okay. Society. Probably, okay. if you get started with Lepidopterists, uh, <laughs> it'll finish it out for you. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, le a Lepidopterist is uh, someone who collects butterflies right. and moths, okay. or studies them. Studies uh, them, Many right. of our, our members don't actually collect. Okay. Um, they simply observe, um, or they uh, photograph, or both. Um, and some of us do all of that and collect. Um, and it's a very open group. Uh, we have we may have nothing in common with one another except the interest of butterflies and moths in Kentucky. And uh, my mentor, who helped me get get active as an adult in lepidoptery, um, told me that uh, lepidoptery is not a snooty science. <laughs> and okay. and I soon learned that that was true as I went uh, a year or two after that to a meeting of the Lepidopterist Society where the world's greatest Lepidopterists were, including the head of the of entomology at the Smithsonian Institute. Mm -hmm. And that very individual, Dr. Clark, um, took time with me, a rank amateur, to answer the questions that I had and um, seemed not bothered a bit that I was... Uh, a beginner. A beginner, mm -hmm. yeah. So they're good I've people. I've always found they're very good people. And it's a lot of fun. And incident, you are the president, are you not, of the Kentucky no. Society? Yes, yes. Oh. <laughs> I didn't have much opposition vying <laughs> 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 for the position. Ah, well, thank you so much for, for, for our, uh, that community support. Of that. Well, let's get back. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm intrigued. What do we the, have on display here? Um, this is... Uh, uh, these are hybrid butterflies. A hybrid is a cross between two different species. Okay. Um, and in Kentucky, that we've done a significant, um, we had a significant experience um, with hybrids that has led to a new hypothesis of why they occur. Um, the two species that this hybrid uh, is the result of uh, inter species mating. Right. Um, the two species involved are the viceroy, which is Kentucky's official butterfly. Oh, okay. It's native to Kentucky as well as it's common um, through in the eastern United States. And another common butterfly, the red spotted purple. Um, these two butterflies look dramatically different uh, from one another, but they actually are very closely kin. They're in the same genus, uh, and they're, uh, they are two distinct species, but they in their evolution, they have they are near enough still in time to having been one ancestral species that if that occasionally they will mate with one another and the mating uh, can be fertile. Okay. Um, okay. Interestingly enough, only males only male hybrids have been collected in the wild. Uh, okay. They've been able in the laboratory to produce some female okay. hybrids, but they're usually uh, sickly and um, uh, deformed. Okay. Um, that's part of the hazards of being a hybrid. Okay. Uh, now the males, the male hybrids are fertile and there's a phenomenon known as uh, back crossing. Okay. A back cross is the result of the hybrid uh, that survives, the male hybrid of the, these two, mating with one of the species uh, of his parents. 
uh, so uh, it, it right. would gradually uh, get more like the, the parent species that he mated with and his hybrid design would be less evident. These are, these are five of the six hybrids collected in Kentucky. These are so rare that it's there to catch a hybrid is a catch of a lifetime. Oh, is it? Just to get to see one. Yeah. Now, now, did you now, catch these? I caught one. This okay. one is from Paducah, uh, oh. 1998, from Massac Creek. Um, and the, uh, this one is from Louisville from much earlier in the 1950s. The very first one collected in Kentucky recorded was 1948. Two boys collected it. Um, and it has been destroyed by museum beetles. That's the reason um, that we you may smell a little whiff of uh, mothballs here. We keep uh, some naphthalene in the boxes to, yes. to keep okay. the museum beetles away. And if you don't, sometimes a disaster like that occurs. But uh, each of the collectors who collected this rarity uh, gave it to the Kentucky Collection, which uh, Dr. Charlie Covell um, assembled and curated it, um, when he was at University of Louisville. That collection has been transferred to the University of Kentucky Collection. Okay. Uh, they've been very nice at UK at welcoming the Kentucky Lepidopterists and we feel very much at home there. Um, and uh, one of our members is curating the collection now. Dr. Covell, when he retired, went to the place for professional lepidopterists, uh, the University of Florida's uh, McGuire Center. At, uh, we had another professional lepidopterist who was with us, uh, who was a professor in the biology department at Western State University, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jeff Marcus, um, and uh, he was in, his studies were, were in uh, DNA, and he was using butterflies as the medium. Dr. Oh. Marcus was actually at Western Kentucky yes. University. That's, and, uh, uh, that's what I meant I to say if I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, cool. And uh, he's now at the University of Manitoba, okay. um, and having just moved there this year. Oh, but okay. he comes back, came back to uh, our annual meeting. But um, this partly is uh, the general, three of these hybrids, these two and this one, were collected at Hickman, Kentucky on the Mississippi River. Now that occurrence of three hybrids plus in the in 30 some years we not only collected three hybrids there in essentially the same spot we also observed two hybrid matings as they were occurring hmm. and that is a pretty dramatic thing to see this <laughs> butterfly and this butterfly mating with one another they're so different in their color oh. um, and uh, in the two hybrid matings the female was the viceroy and the male was the red spotted purple which was a little different than they, they had had better luck in the laboratory oh. at University of Maryland, uh, where studies were done years mm -hmm. earlier, um, uh, with the sexes reversed. And the DNA studies that Dr. Mark, uh, Dr. Jeff Marcus did, with the two most recent ones, the 1998 and the 19, uh, 2003 hybrid, these, he was able to get DNA, uh, mitochondrial DNA from that was fresh enough that he could determine that the mother was a viceroy and the father was a red spotted purple, just as in the two matings that we saw. Mm -hmm. So that's um, five incidents uh, documented of hybridization in one spot. Um, hybrids were once considered to be just a, an extremely rare, rare random thing. occurrence, mm -hmm. but this has led to a theory right. of hot spots. And gotcha. Tell you right Kentucky, Kentucky was unique, didn't I, Greg? <laughs> 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 ah. well, These specimens are with Dr. Covell down at the McGuire Center for study. Gotcha. Uh, and be well taken care of. That would be down at the University of Florida right. in Gainesville. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, um, I think we need to take a, another short break. I'm going to take all this break. in, too. Oh, right. Oh, <laughs> okay, Greg. And th this is another wonderful happy tale about another special needs animal. This is a little dog named Bismarck. And uh, I think our viewers will enjoy this little uh, story also. So give a listen. Hello, my name is Bismarck. I am almost one year old and I am a Samoyed mix. My life has been pretty rough to say the least. When I was a stray, a very nice lady found me. I was limping badly. She took me to the vet to see what was wrong. Turns out, 
I had been shot. My injury was so severe, they had to amputate my leg. It wasn't easy, but I learned to manage. She then took me to creatures great and small with the hope that I would be adopted. Then one day a nice couple took me to a farm, and I was ever so grateful. Now I run and play with the other farm animals. I love to be pet, and would just as soon be pet as eat. Hard to believe, I know. Thanks to creatures great and small and the nice lady who found me, I now have happy home. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that little tale about Bismarck and another special needs. And I guess one of the things that these two animals that you saw with Happy Tales today demonstrate is that um, these animals need a home also. And just I mean, because they have special perfect. needs doesn't mean that they are not just wonderful pets. That's right. And so please consider that as you, if you think about adopting a cat or a dog. Take a look at the little up. Uh, as Donna Groves calls them, handy. Handy cats. <laughs> handy handy cats and handy, handy dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we're, we're uh, talking this afternoon with Bill Black, right. who's uh, from Paducah and a moth and butterfly expert, and we're just getting a fantastic education today. Oh, I know. I'm, uh, I, I feel like I started off in kindergarten right now, Greg. I'm learning so much. <laughs> of course, I didn't know much to start with. So, uh, Okay. Uh, Bill... <laughs> Since the moths and butterflies are a good indicator of how healthy the environment is and mm -hmm. everything, what can we do as individuals to promote the well-being of moths and butterflies in our area? The most important thing we can do is to preserve the habitats. Okay. More and more, science is realizing that extinctions occur uh, most often when the habitat of, a, of an animal uh, or a plant right, is destroyed. Okay. Um, the uh, exam uh, uh, an obvious example would be the, f the food plant. Uh, if the food plant is destroyed, the caterpillars can't survive and you have extinction, at least in that area. If you mm -hmm. have that in an extremely widespread area, you may wipe out the species. Wipe out the species, okay. Or if you have a very small uh, population of a particular species, it may only take wiping out okay. a, a small habitat to do it. So there are such a so, thing as, as butterfly bushes or yes. right. things um, that you can plant in your yard? What, what to can we do in our eye. backyard? In your backyard, the easiest thing would be to allow on the margin of your backyard uh, your wildflowers to grow. And okay. you can start with the ones that naturally will come up if you don't mow them down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, in fact, uh, uh, local and state governments could do that, and some of them are. If you notice in Illinois, uh, there's an effort to allow, to encourage the uh, growth of prairie flowers. Gotcha. And with that, you get prairie animals uh, like butterflies. There's one that's an endangered um, species, the regal fritillary, and uh, it has been endangered because so many prairies so many acres of prairies, yes. square miles of prairies have been lost. And now it's beginning to come back as prairies are uh, reconstructed. Okay. Uh, so let your wildflowers grow. Let In the autumn, there are three that are especially good. Eupatorium, a tall white flower. Okay. Um, goldenrod and mm -hmm. frost asters in that order. Uh, the frost asters are the last ones blooming. The Eupatorium okay. blooms in August and butterflies love them. Okay. There's some, you can use uh, uh, plants that are not from this area. Um, zinnias are very good. Okay. And uh, generally, the colors of flowers that most attract butterflies are yellow and red. Yellow and red. Um, mm -hmm. Blues and those colors are not quite as attractive to okay. them. And highly hybridized or highly cultured um, um, flowers generally are not as attractive to butterflies because the butterflies have evolved with the natural ones. I got gotcha. you. There are some bushes that are especially good. Uh, Budlia is good. My wife Nancy planted them in our backyard and they have brought butterflies into our yard that I used to not ever see. Um, butterfly bush is another um, bush that's good. Um, you, um, Lantana is especially good, not in the blue colors that, because they are cultured but in the yellow and reds, 
lantana is very good, but it it can't survive our winters here, so you have to okay. take those in. Uh, I mm -hmm. notice you have a book on the front uh, here. Yeah. It, what is that a book for a beginner or? What? Uh, it's both. It's for the beginner, but also the very experienced collectors use it to identify. Okay. Um, butterflies. Um, and uh, moths. In fact, uh, Dr. Charlie Cavell wrote the, uh, this uh, guide to the moths, Peterson and Field Guide to the Moths. Peterson's and, yeah, Field Peterson Guide. Peterson Field Guide to the Butterflies. butterflies. Mm -hmm. And, that's and Eastern up. Butterflies. That's, um, you wouldn't want to get the one that shows the California butterflies. Okay. <laughs> you, you'd have a hard time matching them up. And that's at our local library. In the backyard. <laughs> Excuse me, that's at our but, local library, right? Yes. Here, okay. Yeah. And you know, Bill, you're just such a fountain of information, and you did tell me that you do go into elementary schools and places, mm -hmm. but if somebody wanted to contact you more to get mm -hmm. more information, would you give a contact number? Yes, sure. Okay. 270-442-9555. Um, uh, okay. Right. Okay. You have so, a chance of getting me or my wife, Nancy. Okay. Uh, and right and the butterfly experts will be on the other end of uh, <laughs> viewers. Okay. <laughs> that, that, that's great. So got that information out. So As we get ready to close our show then, Bill, you've given us a wide range of information and things. What would be the, maybe the most important thing that you'd like to have our viewers remember from the show today? Uh, that we have some really interesting butterflies here in our area and that you can be a uh, help in proliferating them by having the appropriate flowers in your yard. You can, um, the seed stores probably have a list of flowers that are known to be good for butterflies if you didn't remember the particular ones we talked about. Okay. Um, helping to uh, not destroy habitat. Um, is, is another. For example, cane is a, a very important uh, habitat. You know, uh, several species of birds went extinct because cane uh, was uh, nearly wiped out. We had thousands of square miles of cane in the south uh, before uh, our ancestors settled. Uh, now we, we don't have anything like that. We have little remnants, but there still are some um, creatures, uh, some leps in cane, two of which are being described by a scientist who um, uh, is in Connecticut. Uh, he doesn't have cane that far north, so we've had a great <laughs> time in Kentucky collecting specimens for him. They're going to be used by him in describing these species uh, and when he names them. Um, and uh, he, I hope that Kentucky will be the uh, the um, uh, forerunner. The uh, let's see what they call it. The type locality oh, okay. uh, is okay. the description uh, mm -hmm. of where it's typically found for this one right here. We, we use the temporary names. We don't say the scientific names yet. These are all moths that are in the genus Papapima. They're caterpillars bore into the stems of plants and they scour out the inside, eating it and hiding from predators, birds. Um, and uh, then emerge out. Uh, they pupate in the, in the stems or maybe on the ground. But these two feed on cane. And Kentucky is close to the northern limit. Uh, it's about 50 miles up in Illinois. is as far north as you ever see cane. And uh, this particular, that's new species, Papapima new species number four. And this is new species number five. All right, now when you say, wait a minute. Okay, Those so are new species. Names, new species. Uh, okay. Now, they have been around for millions of years, just like the other uh, moths and butterfly species. Okay. So I, I guess, Greg, we're going to have to do a part two on our next show uh, <laughs> to, to really get the punchline <laughs> about new species in Kentucky, right? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. We, <laughs> That'll we, be a million years old and be new. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we've just run out of time, unfortunately. But we would like to thank you so much for coming to the show today and sharing your knowledge of uh, moths and butterflies. And, and your and, collections. Yes. It's, yeah. it's just a fountain of information. And uh, we're just so impressed and yes. so thankful, to, you know, yeah. that, that you could share this with us. So in closing. Woo, hi. I've got a lot of I know it. Yeah, Angie, you can wake up now, honey. I'm Darlene. I'm Greg. And we want our viewers to remember our favorite phrase. Give your pet a little extra love today and, and every, every day. day.